Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode 396. Something happens when we get in front of that Google Doc and it's blank and that cursor staring at us in the face. Attention gifters, bakers, crafters, and makers. Pursuing your dream can be fun. Whether you have an established business or are looking to start one now, you are in the right place. This is Gift Biz Unwrapped, helping you turn your skill into a flourishing business. Join us for an episode packed full of invaluable guidance, resources, and the support you need to grow your gift biz. Here is your host, gift biz gal, Sue Monheit. Hi there, it's Sue, and thanks for joining me here on the show. Today, you're going to walk away with at least one, probably more, ways you can make your language more enticing to your customers all while staying true to your brand and natural way of speaking. This topic has been something I've been thinking about a lot, even before I met Lucy. Whether I'm talking or typing, I've noticed I gravitate to the same words over and over again. They aren't bad words, but they've gotten boring with overuse. Beautiful, so creative, that's wonderful, and I'm excited are all authentic and heartfelt except I know I can do better to bring more spice to my messages. I'm thinking adding more pizzazz will be entertaining for you too, making emails more fun to read, social posts more shareable, and overall, separate my copy and content from the crowd. You can do this too to make your brand stand out. Lucy's here to show us the way. Today, we're going to learn how to make our messaging more impactful through a conversation with Lucy Badewi. Lucy is a personality-driven copywriter and owner of My Right Hand Woman, who specializes in crafting copy for businesses that want to make a mark online. She says, your copy is the salesperson who works for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you've got that amount of work out of a person, well, that would be illegal. Lucy has worked with a variety of companies ranging from growing solopreneurs to multi-million dollar brands. Her signature skill? She uses clients' brand voice and zesty humor to help them stand out online, create a fun brand experience, and scale much faster. Lucy, you're just who we need here today. Welcome to the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. Me too. I have to tell you, we've been talking topics for blogs, how to write emails, but we've never really talked about the style of writing and talking. So super excited to dive into that. But before we do, I want to ask you another question to get to know you in a little more of a creative way. And that is through a motivational candle. So if you were to think of a candle, you just envision one that totally speaks you. What would your candle look like by a color, quote, or any other creative things you'd like to add to it? Oh, I love this. I think when I think of a candle, the first thing that comes to mind would be the scent. And when Yankee Candle was really big, I was obsessed with buttercream. So it would have to be something in the vanilla, something's baking, something delicious realm. And then in terms of color, definitely hot pink. I would be very on brand with that choice. And a motivational quote for my candle would be, just because you dim your own light doesn't make other people's light shine brighter. Because I'm all about making sure that you are showing up the best as yourself so that everyone around you can glow. I like the approach that you took to this. You have control over how bright your light shines. So why would you want to dim yours? Absolutely. (laughs) And it's kind of leading to the idea to me that, you know how we can all be bubbly in person? Like if you and I were sitting over coffee, let's say, we'd talk, we'd chatter, we'd laugh, we'd be ourselves, we'd be friendly, etc. The second we get in front of an audience or the second we get in front of our screen because we have to write something, there's like this filter that comes over us and we dim our light then, I think. Absolutely. I mean, you said the magic word. You said if we were sitting and having coffee on your couch, you know, we would just be talking casually about your business, your offers, what lights you up. But something happens when we get in front of that Google Doc and it's blank and that cursor is staring at us in the face where we're like, okay, now I need to just put that all away. But the truth is you need to bring all of that, that casualness, that fun, that personality, because that's really what helps things elevate. It sounds a lot easier than it is, (laughs) right? Yes, I... (laughs) Fully in agreement with that statement. 
because I realized that I think personally I've gotten better at that. I just try to write as if I'm writing to a friend or writing to like, I'll think of one or two clients and pretend like I'm just writing to them because it's a topic we've talked about together recently or something, but it's still difficult. It's still hard to do. And I know that this is a wall, I'll say, that a lot of us can't get over. Hence, we never do start writing our blog or we never do start an email strategy. We know we should, but when we get to it, it just feels too difficult or we feel like we're being too vulnerable, maybe. I think that's a big one, especially vulnerability and authenticity. I mean, those are two very big buzzwords, but it's like, where is the line? Like, how can we be more authentic? How can we be more vulnerable in our business without feeling like our deepest, darkest secrets are out on display all the time? So that is such a common thing that people will tell me. Yeah. And let's face it, we can still decide what we're going to talk about. It's not like we have to be a 100% open book, but it's how do you make the things that you talk about stand out and sound interesting and be on brand? And I know we're going to get to this, but you impress me so much with just all these fun words you have. Thank you. I don't even know where they all come from. And maybe we're going to get into that and you'll share some secrets. <laughs> but tell me how you got started and having this be your interest for a business. Yeah, so I got started fresh out of college. I knew from my senior year that I don't think I'd be very happy in a corporation just because I've always been one of those people who wants to do things my way and doesn't take authority very well. And that's something I do know about myself. So when the pandemic hit and I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to get a job anyways. It kind of turned into this thing of, well, let me just go all in. Let me try it. This is a really great time for me to just do it and see what happens. And if it fails, it fails. And at this point, I had been a writer for about seven years, writing for a food publication. And I actually was able to gain some traction with my articles because I would try these crazy celebrity diets for a week and talk about what happened. And as I'm sure any listener can realize, they probably took a crazy turn for the left sometimes. So that was my way of being able to express myself and and connect with people through writing. So becoming a copywriter was kind of a natural progression, but I think the toughest part was thinking, okay, well now how can I take my love of writing, mix it with my marketing degree and create a business that can actually support me and help other female entrepreneurs grow. I think it's perfect because, and especially when we talk about teaching other people how to write in their own voice, not many people are doing that. I mean, we can all hire ghost writers to write blog articles for us. I mean, I even have some clients who have other people writing their emails for them. And I've done that too, but you still need your voice. Yeah. And you still need to be able to word it with the personality of your brand and all of that. And even if you have someone writing for you, you have to know what it is to be able to relay it to them so they can do it for you. <laughs> you <know? Yes. laughs> so, were you loving, like, what do you call it now? Creative writing as you were growing up in school? Was this just a natural to you all this time? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if my mom was here, she would say that I had lined paper, like just thrown around my childhood bedroom as a kid with like stories upon stories, like mostly just realistic fiction, writing about my experiences. And she was like, okay, my child is crazy. It's how I expressed myself. And I just had such an affinity for it from a young age. And then I just feel so fortunate that I was able to kind of connect the dots. And now I get to wake up and do it every day. So it aligns with something that naturally has come to you all this whole time, your whole life. Yeah. And now it just gets to be amplified and people actually get to read my stuff, which is really cool too. Read your stuff and we need your direction badly. <laughs> <laughs> we do. So let's circle this around to our listeners here. I don't know if we've all thought about the fact that we need to write and have it match our brand. I mean, we've talked a little bit about this in terms of adjectives of how you would define your brand, but not necessarily you as the writer for your brand. So how would you start talking to us about that? Yeah, I mean, if, I would say if you are very new, like you've never even thought of this concept before, the best thing you can do is figure out how you naturally speak. If you've ever had a corporate job, or even if you had like a strong education, if you went to college, took a bunch of English classes, chances are you were taught how to write and how to speak in a way that is on paper very good and very coherent, but it's not the way that people talk. And it's hard to make that readable because it's a little bit too formal for what we're going for with web copy. So I would say take out your voice notes. This is going to be the cringiest thing you ever do and record yourself explaining your offers as you would to your mom, your best friend 
recommend if you are meeting a client for coffee. And that is definitely the best way to think, okay, well, how would I describe what I'm making or what I'm baking or the product that I have? How would I say this to someone who I'm really close to? And that is such a great way when you go back and listen to that voice memo, you know, you're going to hear your own voice, but you can kind of see the patterns. Maybe you say y'all and you're like, oh, wait, why didn't I write y'all in my web copy? Like, that's how I talk. So you'll be able to see the different mannerisms and the patterns and how you're speaking and then transcribe it to the page. And then if you've already kind of done that, I mean, maybe not that exact thing, but you want to kick things up a notch, that's when I like to kind of give the visual of a Venn diagram. You have how you speak in one circle, but then you have how people want to be spoken to and how your brand presents itself. So that's the more inception mind complex like thinking, but think about who's actually buying your products. Is it women who are new moms? They're in their early 30s. Is it women who have just retired? Is it men? Is it students that are maybe 14, 15 in high school? How would they speak? Because your brand needs to speak to the way that they're naturally speaking to each other. And that feels comfortable for them to receive. Yes. I mean, I've had a couple of emails come to me. Well, not just a couple, but people that I do business with that I learn from, but their emails, it just doesn't relate to me. And it feels like a disconnect. It almost makes me rethink, like, is this the right person that I should be working with? Just in words that are on an email. So, I mean, that's just reinforcing to me exactly what you're saying here. And I'm thinking, if you're listening, if you can think back to some emails that just didn't land well for you when you opened them, that's where there's a disconnect in the Venn diagram, right, Lucy? Because it's your voice and your customer's voice. And how do you intersect those two in a real way, right? In a genuine way. And that's where the magic happens, I'm guessing. For sure. I mean, you just hit the nail on the head with words are powerful. And, you know, even if you have something that's beautifully designed or a product that's just absolutely fabulous, like that is a very important part of the equation. But the way people are going to connect with you and become a fan for life is what they read is how they talk to you. And I'm assuming you're not getting on the phone with everyone who's ever bought your product. So by talking to them through your email and not treating email like something that you write every week to just write it, same goes for your website, you can actually speak to every single person who comes into your world. How do you confirm that the way you talk, like that intersection area, that the way you talk is really hitting the mark with your audience? There's a few things you can do. I mean, I am also a little bit of a data head, so you can look at your analytics. If you notice that maybe your open rates are really high for your email or you're getting a lot of traffic to your website, but it's just not converting, people aren't taking that next action, whether it's clicking a CTA button or adding something to their cart or actually making that purchase, well, then there's the disconnect. You're like, okay, well, I'm getting eyeballs on my site, but those eyeballs aren't turning into fans. So that would be something where I'd say, okay, well, let's go back to that intersection and see if there's something that's off. I mean, it could be a million factors, but usually it's a disconnect in the messaging. And then you can also look at analytics and data. You can kind of, when you test different headlines, different subject lines, see what's performing, see what people are resonating with. Ask people who bought from you, like what made you buy my product? And chances are what they're going to say is going to be a combination of your amazing product and how you communicated it. They might not even realize potentially that it's the wording that you're using that either makes them really interested and push the buy button or doesn't. They just be be saying, well, you as a person, like in what you stand for, they might not specifically say, well, it's because of the beautifully worded emails. (laughs) (laughs) Loved your subject line, had to purchase. (laughs) (laughs) Which I want to get to some of that also. But to the point that you made a little while ago, depending on where we fall in the generations, you know, I mean, I know when I was in school, everything was perfect English, period, and, you know, all it is, not it's, you know, if you're going to write formally and all that. And I feel like in this day and age, we need to get out of that. To your point, you should be writing the way you talk, right? So people, when they're reading it, can almost even hear your voice coming through in their head, right? Absolutely. I mean, I always joke English teachers would scream if they saw the way I'm writing and the way I'm selling my writing. They'd be like, that's a fragment. That's a run. Like, And I'm like, no, no, I'm just making it so people buy things. And the truth is people don't read the same way they would read like an amazing piece of prose or literature. They're just clicking on your website, giving it a quick skim and being like, oh, okay, cool. I guess I could use a candle, adding it to cart and purchasing or leaving the website. So you're writing for a very different purpose than you would be if you were looking to like flex that perfect grammar. 
Yeah. So if you're writing for a book, it's a whole different story than if you're writing on your website or an email, et cetera. Absolutely. Okay. So that's really, really good to know. I have to ask you this because this is such a pet peeve for me. The salutation line, dear whatever, right? Do you have any recommendations on that? And the reason I ask is I always like to use, and every email provider now allows you to just merge in a first name, but you know, you'll have people do these creative salutation lines like, hey, friend, or what's up, girlfriend, or, you know, like all these things that when they're not used well, are a real turnoff. What do you think about that? You know, some of the customization that might come in. I'm sticking with emails for now, but. For sure. I mean, you definitely are like, from what you're saying, it sounds like a lot of people are using pet names in the space. So you see a lot of like, hey there, lovely. What's up, babe? You want Yeah, what is up with that? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So I think when it comes to that, it really comes down to if your brand can pull it off. If you are someone where like that just irks you and makes your tummy do a somersault, it's always going to sound fake if you try and use it. So just use people's name. You don't have to say like dear name if you're like, that's so formal. You can just say like, hi there, first name, you know, and start the conversation organically that way. But if you do have a brand that's a little bit more... I'm not going to say like cheerleader vibes, but like that's the word that's coming to mind. I actually have some clients that do call all of their community beauties and lovelies and they have super successful businesses, but they feel that that is actually what they feel in their core and what they want to call their community. So I think it really comes down to what you can stomach, but also what you feel like your community can resonate with and what you can commit to. If you can't commit to one or two pet names that feel really authentic to you, I would say stick to the first name. We've also heard it in the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. People love to hear their own name. So if you can get that first name in the subject line in the first couple of lines of the email, golden. And to your point, if you don't normally talk like that, don't start sending emails that way just because they look different and fun and pretty or whatever it is. All right. But customization and the point about names is super important, I think. And also, again, just sticking with emails, like I think it's uh, nice to separate the conversation for us into emails versus then we're going to go into the website. I see a lot of emails and we actually do this in ours as well only a sentence or two for each paragraph. Some paragraphs are only three or four words, dot, 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 because that's the way I talk. (laughs) You know, I feel like I'll just think of how I'm talking and I kind of just type it as I talk it type thing. All of that is okay in emails. It's not just okay, it's encouraged. I think the shorter the sentence, the shorter the paragraph, the more white space you can have. If you're a maker, or especially if your product is very beautiful or the look of your product is very important, put pictures in those emails and structure it more of like a newsletter. Make it so that the whole email is an experience, not an essay, because my guess is you're not selling essays. Not selling essays. And I don't know if everyone will agree with my behavior, but I open an email and I see long paragraphs and I'm over it. I close out and go away. I don't have the time. Something that you could have told me in a sentence and a half is like a paragraph an inch long. Too much for me. I'm on my way. I just don't have time. (laughs) You're not alone. That is such common behavior. I mean, I think we always underestimate how little of an attention span people have. And what we think is so important, I mean, I'd love to think that all of my customers want to hang on my every word. They don't. They have their own things to do. I am much less important than that. (laughs) You know, I need to get to the point, tell them what I need to tell them with some color, you know, why it's important to them and get the word across as fast as I can. What do you say about that? Is that true? Definitely. I think we, especially emails, like our inboxes are flooded. You know, we probably have multiple inboxes we're checking every single day. So the best thing you can do is grab someone's attention in the first subject line, make those CTAs higher up on the email than you would usually do it because most people aren't hitting the bottom of the email. And just really focusing on what's in it for the person who's going to be purchasing from you. What would be a product that they would really love and they would want to purchase? Maybe even think about segmenting your audience. If you are targeting multiple people, sending different emails to different people and promoting different products that you think would be the most applicable to their life. Okay, so we've got that for emails. I'm going to get to the flowery wording choices in a minute. But how does this then change when you're doing a blog? Yeah, so when it comes to content writing, 
I always make the distinction between copywriting and content writing. I do both for clients, but I think it's good to know like the semantics, like what is what. Okay. So blogs are definitely in that content umbrella. So copy is meant for getting people to purchase, take an action, really hardcore persuasion, just like using all of those sales psychology, making sure that it's really short to the point, all that good stuff. Content, obviously, you still want to do some of the same things. You don't want to write these crazy, long, extra bland paragraphs. But content, you have a little bit more flexibility to really speak through your mind and educate and inform and just connect with people. You don't have to be as to the point because the whole point of someone clicks on your blog is they're coming there to read. So you do have like 500, 750, even a thousand plus words to play with. And that's a really great time for you to go deep into maybe your making process, show them behind the scenes, or maybe talk about a client case study where like if you have, especially if you're selling wholesale or you want to sell to more corporations, be like, well, this happened, this is what they purchased, and this is how it went. So you can start to get some of those bigger sales as opposed to just smaller direct to consumer sales, if that's something that you're interested in. But blogs are really your opportunity to go deeper into educating your audience and bringing them into your world in not quite as a salesy way. Not as a salesy way, but still with interesting wording, right? Absolutely. Okay. I'm threading this wording topic through <laughs> for a second. <laughs> okay. So now let's jump over and talk about your website. So is website, I'm thinking you're going to say that that's content, not copy either. Or maybe there's a combination of the two, depending on the page. You tell me. Oh, yeah. Actually, websites are almost always copy. Copy. Yeah. Actually, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think a lot of people think like the content for their website and then they end up getting a content writer and then they don't get the sales that they want because they actually needed a copywriter from the get-go to write that homepage, about page, shop page, product descriptions. So I think that was actually a really good point we actually brought up. Okay. Let's talk about the About Us page on a website. This is my pet peeve, <laughs> you know, because a lot of people will just put a resume up there and call it a day. And we all know now that the About Us page is a really important, very highly read page. What should we really be writing there? You give us a little training here. For sure. So when it comes to an About page, really the main things people are going on to that page is to learn about you. So the common kind of advice we see in the copywriting world is your about page is about you, but for your ideal client. And I think that definitely does resonate to a certain degree. And I think that's important. You know, it's really hard to write about ourselves, but sometimes I think that perspective shift of, okay, well, I'm just telling my story in a very relevant way to my ideal client makes it a little less like, okay, now I need to be like fun and interesting and have fun facts, which can be a little more daunting. So if I was just structuring an about page right now, I would do some sort of header that goes along with your mission, your differentiator, why you started your business, just one line that really like pulls people in. And then I would do a small paragraph that's a little bit like behind the brand or behind the shop. And I would talk about your shop just globally, like how you started it, like why you started it, who you wanted to serve. And then I would move into your story, which is just like taking people a little bit behind the scenes of your life, maybe your background, maybe why you chose to make the thing that you're making or sell the product that you're selling. And then from there, always make sure you end with a CTA where people can go directly to the shop because after they're psyched because they just met you, they love your story, you want to make sure that they can take the next step, which is usually for making a purchase. How about including at some point in there why this information is important to the reader? Do you think that belongs on an, an About Us page? I think if it's more general, absolutely. Like if you found this like new way of using coconut oil and it has the specific benefit on specific types of skin, absolutely put that in like your behind the brand or behind the shop page. Be like, this shop started because I decided coconut oil deserves a higher place in your beauty routine or something like that would be a really strong way to show that without being overtly like coconut oil, coconut oil, which I would like definitely stress for like your product descriptions and the pages that have a little bit more sales on them. But the about page is really just focusing on just so much connection. Like I always say, like an ooey gooey connection with your ideal client of like why you want this shop to be number one on the places they go to for whatever product you're selling. Okay, <laughs> you're going to hate me for this question. <laughs> Define ooey gooey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I just think about it like when you have that one friend and when they give you a hug, you're like, okay, I don't even care. I just had the worst day ever, but my day is so much better right now. 
So it just gives that feeling that you get it. You're there. You're not just some faceless brand because if you are so closely connected to the products you're selling, you're not a faceless brand. You are very in depth with the day to day of what it takes to get these products to your customers. So just making it so that everyone who goes on this about page not only feels like you are the CEO of your product based company, but that you're a friend and you're someone that's making something that's going to make their life better. Mm -hmm. And that they can relate to you. Absolutely. You're not this business owner, customer, and there's a wall in between. But you're kind of like friends and you're talking about, to your point, about how you got started in the business or whatever you would be saying. Mm -hmm. But still, like if I said ooey gooey in my copy, people would think I was insane because that's not a <laughs> word that I would use. But I don't know the words that I use. And often, so I'm asking for a little coaching here, Lucy. Let's do it. I often will gravitate to words that I always say, that I always use. And I know they could be more colorful. I know they could be more visual or flowery or that could still be me, but I don't know how to find them. If I knew I might start using them. Or is that starting to cross the line over to being fake? You know what I mean? Like I look at your emails. They're so fun. You have such colorful words that you use. How do we do that? So if we haven't been creative writers with paper around our childhood bedrooms, how do we get there? I wanted to pause this discussion for a second to let you know that I recognize you may be feeling overwhelmed right now. I mean, I bring on great guests who are specialists in their fields, and we get into fabulous conversations that you know can help grow your business. So. After the show, you have the full intention of grabbing a download, making an adjustment on your website, or any number of other ideas that arise as a result of this podcast. But what happens? You get back to your other activities and the momentum you once had gets lost. What you've planned to do is forgotten. Then you feel bad because your business is going on as usual without implementing anything that you know would help grow your business. We're just too busy doing all the things, like a robot, moving from one thing to another without thinking. Because we have to. I get it. I've been there. But guess what? There is another way. Since I recognized this exact behavior in my own business, I set out to do something about it. And now, what works for me, I'm sharing with you. I formalized the process, and it's called the Inspired Daily Planner, made specifically for gifters, bakers, crafters, and makers. But it's not your ordinary planner. First off, it comes with a video explaining my productivity strategy. Plus, it's not dated, so you can start using your planner the second it arrives at your doorstep. And that's not all. Included for each day is a motivational message or business building tip and plenty of space to capture and book in time for to-dos, schedule appointments, and all those other ideas that are now getting lost. Think of it as a book and a planner all in one, yet compact enough to carry with you and resource as necessary. It's the perfect solution to truly act and move your business forward. Go to giftbizunwrapped.com forward slash inspired to get your hard copy planner along with my power of purpose video that will set you on the path for true business growth. This makes a great gift too. So if you have a biz bestie, pick up a planner for them too. That link again is giftbizunwrapped.com forward slash inspired. Okay, let's get back to the show. I think you raise a really great point because when it comes to flowery or colorful words, I want to make sure that everyone who's listening doesn't kind of see that as needing to add fluff to their writing. So fluff is what I consider to be like describing your product as amazing or awesome, or it's going to change your life. Like all the things where you're like, okay, did that really need to like go into the copy? Like you're selling like beautiful dish towels, but they're dish towels, you know? So it's like this idea of like not being over dramatic and adding in all of these adjectives to try and make your product seem like this big, crazy thing, because that is what usually comes across as fake. 
So when it comes to using more color, especially when you're trying to describe a product, I always say the more specific you can be, the better. So let's say you're selling baked goods, you're selling these beautiful cookies. Instead of just saying, well, I baked these cookies, I put this frosting on them, and then inside you'll find chocolate chips. Talk about the experience. Say like when it's your son's birthday and he wakes up to a giant piping hot plate of cookies instead of his usual Kellogg's frosted flakes. Imagine that smile that's just going to take over. So as you can see, I'm kind of taking that product and making that product a whole experience. And I think that's where you can really make yourself stand out from other people in your industry. Okay, so what I really liked about you just saying, you added piping hot and it came naturally to you, right? Mm -hmm. So by you adding that word, it brought me into that actual place. I could close my eyes and see that image. So maybe that's one way for us to find words is to actually try to put ourselves into and live whatever that experience is, right? For sure. Yeah. And you can absolutely ask your clients, like, how did you experience my product or how did it go? How was the party? And you can take words that your clients are saying and then turn those into narratives, like mini narratives that you can use to describe your product. Mm -hmm. That resonate with you and would come naturally with you, like words that you would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would it make sense? I mean, I even think like now I'm thinking maybe I'll test it out tonight. But like if I'm sitting watching TV and I'm listening to I don't even care what show it is, but they say some interesting words that I never would have thought of. Is it worth making a little list of words you think you could pull from? Yeah, I call it a word wall. And I always encourage my clients to do that. A word wall. Yeah, you just kind of when something like hits you and you're like, wait, I could use that to describe this. Or maybe you don't even have a use for it, but you're like, I'm kind of obsessed with that phrase. Write it down. That's a great idea. A word wall. We're all building word walls, you guys. Everyone's homework, build a word wall. You could even have it in just your planner or something, just a page mm -hmm. of words. Yeah. They have to be words that you like that fit your brand, obviously. For sure. I think when it comes to stuff like that, like a word wall or like, I do want to make it like a small caveat though about using words that you like, just because it's so important that your brand tone overall is aligned with who you are. You know, if you're a really casual person, you're not going to write in a really formal way. But I would say, especially if you're struggling with sales or you feel like your brand is off and you do hire a copywriter, I would say the best thing you can do is to just keep an open mind and realize that, you know, maybe the way you speak like to the law isn't what's going to be what sells your product. I just wanted to throw that in there. It's really important that you're not totally misaligned with the way your brand sounds, but definitely like the copywriter speak is going to be a little bit different than probably how you're used to speaking. So it's important to kind of just keep both of those in mind. I used to have a social media person. We do our own social media in house now, but I loved so much what she said. The words would never be what I could even think of using, but they felt so good to me. Every week when I would get, you know, how you'll get your copy, I guess you call it, <laughs> for social media, not content copy, for the social media posts, smiles. Because I'm like, this is so perfect. This is so great. It feels so right. But there was just something about her, again, really super colorful wording that absolutely great. So I think there is a fine line between using too much. So you have to really think about where's the right line. Yeah. And I think the line is usually like thinking about things that are really specific. I think when we talk about fluff or stuffing, it's because people are trying so hard that it comes off as very cliche. So I think really where that line is, is think about an experience from the point of what would actually happen with this product? How would you actually describe it in context, as opposed to how can I beef up this product and make it sound better? So I think if you kind of have that mindset of like a realistic, experiential, fun way that is actually happening, instead of just like making sure that you seem like the best thing ever on the market, it will naturally flow and people will just connect with what you're selling a lot better. Mm -hmm. But you can still use the word wall. Yes, still use the word wall. I think the word wall is such a fun way to just get a better feel for what you like. I need a word wall. I feel like I, well, I also talk a lot, you know, with the podcasts and, you know, emails and all of that. So I feel like I need some new words that equally resonate with words I already use. So I'm doing it. Lucy, I'm doing it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I might even have a pen and paper at the ready while I'm watching TV tonight. You never know. Actually, maybe. No, I won't. I'm kidding. I was going to say, actually, I'm going to go back and look at all your emails, but that's not right. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> 
now that I've said emails again, I kind of forgot to ask you this question. I really wanted to. Subject lines for emails. I think there's also, when we talk about that balance, right, between making sure that you stay credible and true versus getting the attention and trying to prompt people to open an email. What do you say about, you know, what you talk about in subject lines? So when it comes to a subject line, the best thing you can do is be as concise as possible. I think that that is like the number one, like keep it short, keep it relevant to the email, but pick out the most important, most exciting part of the email. So instead of saying something like candles are on sale this week, you could just say like sale with like a fun emoji and be like, click inside to get your exclusive code. So just making it very action oriented and making it so that from that subject line, they have to click because your subject line really has one job. It's just to get people to open the email and then your email will do the rest of the work. So I would say it's probably a hybrid between making it like a little bit clickbaity because you definitely want people to click, but not so clickbaity that people click the email and they're like, oh, there they go again, just writing some subject line that has nothing to do with the email. So I think it's that happy medium. Right. Well, and if it's clickbaity, it might not even get into the primary folder, like in Gmail, yeah. <laughs> you know, it might go to promotions or spam. So you do want to be careful. Also with how many emojis you use. Yeah, I would say one emoji. <laughs> you say one? Okay. Yeah, if you use an emoji, just one. Just one. <laughs> Although I have been seeing people use emojis more and more, which I love, you know, it just adds to the flavor, I think. I agree. I think anytime you can add a visual or just something that's going to grab an eye is top notch to it. Okay, so circling back, we were talking about how does someone get started and add a little bit more color to how they speak. The first thing you said is talk as if you're talking to your friend. Record an audio recording or whatever and listen to the words that you use and try to duplicate that as you can in your writing. And then you also, the whole Venn diagram, one thing that you're talking, but how are people receiving? And there's got to be kind of a commonality between the two. And you can look at those by looking at your opens, your website visits that convert to sales, things like that, to get a feel for if you're in alignment, if you're not sure. Like, I kind of feel like I know what my customers would resonate with because I've been working with them for so long. But if you don't, or if you're new to business, this would be a good way to do it. Or if I tested out new words, I need to check and make sure that I'm not doing something that turns people off, too. And so would you add anything to those two things for people who are listening just as they're getting started? These would be the two things to do. I think the number one thing I would just add, I mean, I think you summed it up beautifully, is be consistent. I mean, if you're going to have a brand voice, it's only going to work if that brand voice is present on all of your customer touch points. So if you decide that you want to be like irreverent and have like this kind of dry sense of humor, just because you get one hater is not a reason to like turn it off. You have to keep leaning into it and commit to it because that's how you're going to draw people in. So that would be a big, a big thing that I would say is consistency when you're using a brand voice or you're writing in a certain way for your company is so much more important than creating it. You really have to use it. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of certain people now who swear all the time. Like that's part of how they talk. That's just it. And you see it if they're on video, if they're doing lives, you see it in their written copy, you see it in their emails everywhere. They just stay consistent because that's who they are. So, okay. All right. Wonderful. Mistakes. If you were to give me one or two mistakes that you see that we should be cautious of as we consider making a switch in our style to be more in alignment with our conversation today. What are some mistakes? I think a big mistake I want to talk about, especially based on the conversation we just had, is when business owners prioritize cleverness over clarity. I think they can both coexist. I think you can make jokes. I think you can make cultural references and use fun words. But when you stop getting to the core of who you are as a business, what you sell, how you add value and how you're different, people are not going to buy because they're going to be confused. So I definitely think clarity has to be there first. And then once you have the clarity, you can pepper in the cleverness and then they can both coexist. But clarity always has to come first because at the end of the day, we're not trying to be like these crazy, amazing creative writers. We're trying to be richer business owners. So we have to think about it from a business standpoint before we can have more fun with it. So clarity in terms of communicating to our customers, obviously what the products are that we offer, why they're of value, how to purchase those very simple, basic things, why your product is different from somebody else's. 
you know, it's those things to be very clear on. And then you can get more descriptive and fun with describing those topics as long as that stays clear. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Clarity over cleverness. Okay. Another mistake? Another mistake I often see is this is a pretty easy fix. So I think oftentimes we use a lot of I because we're used to referencing ourselves. So we'll say things like, I help people by doing this and I make this because it leads to this result. So I want you to chop out all of those I's, all of those I do, I help, I make, and just say what it is. So I'll give you guys this an example in practice. So we're going to change I-centric copy to you-centric copy with you being your ideal client. So you-centric copy would just be like candles for every day. You have me think about candles now. I feel like anyone who is a candle maker on this podcast, like she keeps using me. (laughs) So just say exactly what it is that you create. So you can say clothing for the deep winter, you know? So as you can see, I'm just stating what the product is and what it does and how it adds value. And I'm chopping out all of those little like, I do this, I do that, because frankly, it's just not necessary. I also just hearing you say it feel like it weakens the message. Mm -hmm. I like that. I'm thinking about that even for craft shows, like when people come up to booths, just stating what it is that you sell. You know, if it's not immediately obvious, if it's candles, (laughs) it's (laughs) immediately obvious, but it might not be. If you paint with a different technique that's not obvious, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have someone on the show who paints by blowing the paint across the canvas. That's so cool. (laughs) But that would not be completely obvious when you're looking at the beautiful paintings, unless she said that to you. So that would be something that painting's done through, and she's named her technique. I don't remember what it is. But so saying that instead of I'm, you know, it's obvious that she made these paintings. She's the booth owner. So things like that. So interesting. Very interesting. Okay. I like doing things in three, Lucy. Do you have one more mistake for us? Yeah. So I think one more mistake is holding back. I know it can be really tough to just put all of yourself into your writing and letting yourself flow. But the worst thing you can do is like get caught up in perfection. I mean, a first draft is never perfect. And the best thing you can do is just to take this mistake and turn it into the positive is instead of holding back, what you can do is just write. Like literally, if you have to have a glass of wine or make the lighting a little less in your face or whatever you have have to do to just be able to get the words at least onto the page you can always refine later do it because I've noticed that a big issue that when clients come to me they have is not too much to say is they're like I don't know how to talk about my product so the best way to do that is just get it on paper I mean we're not trying to do wordy copy or a ton of copy that is going to just go over your customers heads but you have to at least have something on the page and then we can refine from there That makes sense. And you won't have it done perfectly the first time. Just get it down and then Mm -hmm. go back and maybe even put it aside and then go back. For sure. I kind of feel like, okay, the first word should be this. The second word should be this. Okay, one and two looks good. Now the third word should be (laughs) this, right? And that's such a stressful way, I feel like, of writing. (laughs) But I'm making it a little worse than it is. But how often do we do that? Like, we'll write a little paragraph, and then we'll go back and we'll change the first two sentences of the paragraph. And then, no, we'll change the last sentence of the paragraph. And we're still on that first paragraph, right? (laughs) We've never gotten into the second one yet. And we're already editing the first one. To your point, get it all on paper, and then you can rearrange and do it. It just, I have actually found that that's so much easier, too. Mm -hmm. And you can scrap the whole thing if you have to. Yeah, literally, like, I have such a copy graveyard. Like, you know, it's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. Look, there are your words again, copy graveyard. (laughs) Does this come more naturally to you as you start doing it? I mean, yeah, I write for like six to eight hours a day. Like, I'm not going to lie. But I also think like more than just practice, I think I just approach my life like a writer. Like if something happens to me, I'll just like think like, oh, how would I write about this? Which sounds weird if you're not doing it. But I guess it's a subconscious process that I'm just so used to doing. It must be. Well, I want to be you, Lucy. (laughs) (laughs) But like, we're not all born with that style and that ability. But these are different ways that we can put interject that in. And that's why people hire people like you or learn from people like you or buy services and all that from you because you're able to do it so well and you can help us integrate that into our brands, right? Absolutely. And I love doing it. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about what you provide, your services and such. 
Yeah. So I always like to say, I know as much as we see this world of a lot of people come in and teach versus do, I am a pure play done for you copywriter. So if someone wants to work with me, basically what you're going to do is I'm going to ask you a million and a half questions about your business and I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it into words and write a website or some sales copy or emails that get open and get you more customers, more clients, more traffic. So if you feel like you're really struggling to make sales or you just know that you have this incredible product, but communicating it is just makes you want to pull your hair out, definitely get in touch with me and let's partner up so I can write whatever it is that we need to write and really solidify your messaging and your place in the market. But if you're like, that is a little scary, I'm newer, I'm not totally ready to just hand everything and outsource my copy, then I also offer audits. So what I can do, they're called copy roasts. I can go into your website or a few of your emails and give you my feedback and some verbal edits on things I would change to up your conversion. So if either of those sound good to you, definitely I will, of course, say my links and all that good stuff. And I'm sure they'll be in the show notes, but definitely reach out whether it's like very casually over DMs or filling out the contact form on my website. And we can talk about what you definitely need. Oh, that's wonderful. And there you go again, coffee roasts. Like, seriously. (laughs) Oh, I saw something about templates coming through some emails. What's that all about? Yeah, so I actually have a template shop that is up and coming. So if you feel like you need help, especially on the brand voice side, I have templates for sales copy and web copy. But if you are a maker or a product-based business, they're not as quite applicable. They're a little bit more for service-based businesses. But the brand voice template, I literally take you step-by-step holding your hand through the process that corporations use to build multi-million dollar brand voices. So you can actually have access to that process, that curation process for obviously a fraction of the price since it's a done for a do it yourself resource. Mm -hmm. So if you feel like, okay, I need that, if that just like knocked your socks off, what you should do is you should go to findmybrandvoice.com, take the quiz. And after you take the brand voice quiz, this is super secret, you're going to get a 50% off coupon to use on the brand voice template. So you're going to be able to grab it at like this crazy rate because you went through the quiz. So telling you this because you guys are all insiders now, we've just talked for a few minutes on this podcast. So that would be a really awesome resource, especially if you're just starting out and you're like, I want to have a brand voice that just catapults me to the next level. Yes. And I don't just invite anybody on this podcast. As you guys know, I went through and I took Lucy's test before we even started her talking about her being on the show. And it landed perfect with who I am and what I anticipate my voice should be, you know, and what I'm trying to get out there. I'm so glad. (laughs) And the other ones were so not right. Like some of the answers to the questions, because, you know, you go through a list of questions and it finally tells you what your brand voice is, right? Some of the other answers were so obviously not me. So it was kind of easy to make the selections, but it totally nailed it. So I loved that. I'm so glad you took it. (laughs) Yeah, that's when I responded to the email and I said, let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) And then it got better from there because then I got all of your fun worded emails coming through. So everyone needs to go and do the brand quiz, like seriously just to see it. And then also for sure, you'll see her whole welcome sequence, all of that. It's fabulous. I love it. (laughs) So great. Thank you. (laughs) Wonderful. Well, any final words of encouragement for us as we relook at our copy and our content, I'm going to say with both, adding a little bit more of ourselves into that, which the hope would be, of course, to deepen the relationships with our customer base so they feel more comfortable and would want to buy from us. Give us a pep talk here. Yeah, I think the the biggest thing you can do is know yourself. If you are super new to business, equip yourself with the investments you can physically make. So whether that's a resource or having someone just like audit your copy, or even if you just need to like ask a friend or take a walk, like set yourself up for success. So if you are just staring at this blank Google Doc and it's not coming to you, something needs to shift. So that can be an internal shift or that can be an external shift of actually doing something. But if you're going to DIY, I would say definitely do what you have to do to get yourself in the headspace to properly communicate your brand. And if you're growing, if you're more established and you're thinking, okay, well, I think I'm ready to go to the next level. So for me, the next level is you're looking to kind of create this like multi six figure, seven figure e-commerce shop that's just flourishing. You're reaching your ideal client. That is the part when I would definitely say it's time to outsource. It's time to invest. It's time to build a team. So just to give you some 
I guess, breaking up this podcast into two groups, because especially if you're DIYing, there's so many things out there. There's so many ways to just write an epic website. But if you are at that next level or want to hit that next level, that's the time to bring in help. And if you want my help, if you've liked this episode, you can just head to at my right hand woman on Instagram, write is spelled like writing, send me a DM, or you could just head straight to the website, which is my right hand And again, write is spelled like writing. Perfect. Lucy, thank you so much. You've given us so many tips. You've made it sound so much more doable. Again, we're doing those word walls for sure. Every single one. Yeah, everyone's homework, word walls. Word walls. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, and you guys, let's share the word walls in the breeze. So any of you who are part of Gift Biz Breeze, Lucy, that's my maker's Facebook group. I'm going to start a post there that says, word wall. Now you can't use other people's words that they put up there unless they also resonate with you. But maybe we'll start a master maker wall of words. Something like that. I love this. Please tag me. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be in this group, even though I'm not a maker. Okay, you can come in. Oh, wait till you see there are amazing things happening there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Lucy, thank you again so, so much for all of your direction, input. I'm really excited about this. Thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. Goodbye, fluffy words. Enter in more verbs versus adjectives while still balancing clear over clever. Got it. Don't forget about the new word wall happening over in the breeze. The post, including the wall, will be up and running this Thursday. And if I see that we're adding and using it, I'll keep it pinned to the top of the group so that you can easily reference it. And the unique artist that I referenced in the show, Stephanie of Canary Artwork, is going to be the podcast coming up next week. So watch for that one. If you're enjoying the podcast and would like to show support, a rating and review is always fabulous because it helps get the show seen by more makers. It's a great way to pay it forward. And there's another way where you can get something tangible in return for your support, too. Visit my merch shop for a wide variety of inspirational items, like mugs, journals, water bottles, and more featuring logos, images, and quotes to inspire you throughout your day. And we've just added some new products for the season to the shop. Turnaround is quick, and the quality is top-notch. Nothing but the best for you. (laughs) Take a look at all the options at giftbizunwrapped.com forward slash shop. All proceeds from these purchases helps go to offset the cost of producing the show. And now, be safe and well, and I'll see you again next time on the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. I want to make sure you're familiar with my free Facebook group called Gift Biz Breeze. It's a place where we all gather and are a community to support each other. I've got a really fun post in there that's my favorite of the week, I have to say, where I invite all of you to share what you're doing, to show pictures of your product, to show what you're working on for the week, to get reaction from other people, and just for fun because we all get to see the wonderful products that everybody in the community is making my favorite post every single week, without doubt. Wait, what? Aren't you part of the group already? If not, make sure to jump over to Facebook and search for the group Gift Biz Breeze. Don't delay. Come join us in Gift Biz Breeze. Today, 